welcome back to the pew everybody i am your host john edwards and this week we have a special treat we are doing a bonus episode and if you've been following us for a while you know every once in a while we're blessed to have a great guest usually when we're bringing them into memphis for something and this week is no different I have one of the best friends I've had in a long time in my life here today. And then Bill Donahue's with us, too. So, <laughs> <laughs> Great intro. Great intro. But, but no, my friend Bill is here. Uh, if you've been following us for a while, you know that we've had him on episodes before. And so uh, we're delighted to have him again today on the show. Um, we've talked about transgender in the past. We've talked about TOB, all that stuff. Today, we're just going to chat, see where the Lord takes it, and I'm excited to do that. So, Bill, welcome. Yeah. It's a, a pleasure to have you here in my home and in the studio and in yeah. Memphis again. John and Angela, behind the yep. scenes, it is awesome to be with you. It's been four years, Yeah, which is way too long. Uh, I love <laughs> I love the new place. It looks great. The studio is awesome. Thank you. And I'm just thrilled to be down. Oh, yeah. man, it's, it's awesome. I've the been main looking... reason I came down is just to hang out. And then, oh, yeah, <laughs> we'll give three talks in the morning for the parish. But let's just Oh, the, dude, that's my intention in all of it, right? Yeah. It is, I'm thinking, all right, Guinness Stout cigars on a Friday with uh, Bill Donnie. It sounds good. Let's book them. Let's do it. <laughs> so it's awesome, man. It really is. It's good to see you. I mean, Me you have been uh, just a blessing in my life for a long time. You and Rebecca, your whole family, you know, just it's watching. It's mutual, brother. Well, and I tell people all the time uh, when they ask me, like, look, you've been in ministry for a while now. You met a lot of people who are some of your favorite folks and why. And you're one, always one of the top ones on the mm -hmm. list. And what I tell people is when they ask me, why do you like him so much? I said, well, he pays well. But I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just honestly, I said, you know, when I first met Bill, I was working with Cardinal Studios. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the first time that I'd ever been up there for a meeting. Mm -hmm. We were at Chris's house. Yep. And somebody, I think it was Marcel Lejeune, said, uh, yeah. hey, John's got a story. Tell your story. Mm. And the, the next thing I know, like, Chris had this big picnic table kind of dinner table thing. And when I looked up from crying, you were like three <laughs> inches from my face across the table, like, continue. Yeah, I was engaged. Yeah, full on. I mean, you're, you're just uh, – your vulnerability and honesty and just transparency. Like, all, all the masks fell off. And it was just, like, raw – human being yeah. you know and that's that's magnetic it's beautiful yeah and it's like you know you expose by sharing your story what everybody should that at the end of the day i'm just a broken human being and i'm looking for god's <laughs> love and mercy and mm -hmm. friendship and yeah so that was a great foundation right yeah i've been Solid looking for foundation. love in all the wrong places that's, a, <laughs> that's right yeah that's right. but what a great foundation for any relationship or friendship to start off yeah but we got blessed by that I was, oh, yeah. I was blessed by you so i remember when you opened the door mm. i was like that's that dude from rise like you yeah. opened the door either he's that taller or, than i thought either that or it's george lucas i'm not sure in the moment <laughs> all right now all right hey they don't see the luscious locks you have i'm jealous no. man you know this is the first interview i've ever done with my ball cap on and yeah. i feel really good i feel like we're about to go bass fishing or something <laughs> after this but well, we might hey i love to do All it right. i got a boat in the garage right nice a little cold but we'll, we'll wing it <laughs> but no I'm, i wear the hat because my bald head i don't want to blind the audience yeah, with the anything shine. with the, like shine. the shekinah glory cloud <laughs> well, is it from... shine or sheen i'm not sure but it's one of the two Either one works but no you i remember looking across that table and thinking man this guy is like uh, it's like a grenade could go off beside him and he's not going to look away from me and at the time, I didn't know that. Hmm. But after reading, I think it was some of your work and, and definitely some of Christopher's. And I remember specifically in Jason Everett's book, mm -hmm. the bio he did on on John Paul II. Yeah. Uh, and I know you were credited in helping with that in the beginning. Yeah, you the, get the, in uh, the credits. Do some editing and read it, read through it. Yeah, it was awesome. And I remember he spent so much time talking about how John Paul II, like, if he made eye contact with you, like, you better you better just not move because he's coming to you and all the all his handlers would get angry because like we got to be somewhere in five minutes and he might spend an hour with you you know especially when they tried to like hide the eucharist from him or something in a yeah. place he'd never been he had like a sixth sense for that yeah. and then he would just go and lay prostrate for like three hours right. you know almost in punishing the people that tried to hide jesus from him <laughs> but, right but I, I saw that in you you know and, and that's what i tell people back to when when people say well who's some of your favorite people and why it, I always mention you because I'm like, I don't know, other than maybe like Dr. Bob Schutz, you know, mm -hmm. I, I just don't know many people that that live what they preach as well as what you do. And I know you're on, you're going to be like, stop it. And, and you should yeah, see me at yeah, home and all that. Angela, but, cut, it, cut the feet. Yeah, no, but I'm really, grateful for that. Yeah. I'm grateful for that. And please, God, I mean, I hope after 20 years of dwelling in John Paul II's Theology of the Body and sure. Criticism, I hope something has rubbed off. <laughs> sure. Yeah. But um, for me, like, 
I'm very humbled by that. Yeah, Thank you. That's I know a, you that's are. A, always a blessing. And every time we we talk or you text me, it's always embarrassing affirmations. <laughs> but no, pr- yeah. please God, let it be the fruit of His um, you know, His Spirit moving in me. Because I mean, what else is there? We just talked about this before, sitting on the couch in, in your house in there. Yeah. Like, we, what is this life for? What is this life about? An encounter. Yeah. And we we are frenetic, we're running around, we're all so busy. But at the end of the day, like it's just about this rest encounter in each other, and just what's <laughs> how's it going? Tell me about your life. Tell me your story. And you you know that beginning that first of our friendships, sharing your story. Yeah, it's just so engaging. Yeah, it it was, and then yeah. to learn about you and your story, and and meeting Rebecca, and I mean I remember it like it was yesterday at the trash dump, right? Yeah, or that's at right, the dumpster that's right. outside. That's where we met. Yeah, yeah, that, and then the kids and the adoptions and all those things and. Yeah. And I just, I honestly remember, and again, you know, not to shower you more information that I know make you uncomfortable, even though I do enjoy doing that. Yes, he um, does. He the does uncomfortable certainly. part. I remember seeing things like videos and posts of yours and things when you were still doing some stuff on Facebook. I know you've kind of withdrawn from three some years that. dry from all social yeah. media. Praise the Lord. But just things that was like, man, I want to be like that guy. Like I want to, mm. I want to, I want to have a relationship with my wife like that. And not mm. that Angela wasn't wasn't doing her side of it, you know, and, and being a wonderful wife and all those things. But I was like, I, I know that I'm not being what I should be for her. I know I'm not being what I should be for my kids because our life doesn't look like this. And it's not to get in the sin of comparison at all. Nope. I don't mean that, but it was like, that's inspiring me to want to be a better husband. That's making inspiring me want to want to be a better man. And, and, you know, you talked about all that stuff in the rise series with Krista yeah, Fanning, yeah, you yeah. helped co-author and those things. But it did, and and I just always felt so blessed by your friendship because you weren't, you know, some people you meet in life they don't have time for you, or if they're if they have any mode of of celebrity, and I hate celeb- the word celebrity in the church period. Me too. Me too. But like any of that, it's sort of like okay, thank you, see you later. But you you stuck around, you know, and you're mm. like, hey man, and and I remember the first time you were call- you'd start calling me, and I'm like, wow, he's actually interested in <laughs> in like wanting to be friends, and this is kind of cool. So it was awesome just to just to pursue that, and then to learn. Just, just from you, you know, you're a few years older than I am, and and I was in a place in my life where I was looking for mentors and those yeah. things, and and to have you pour pour back into me and, and sort of like that Paul and Timothy sort of relationship. Mm. I don't know where I if I would be doing and have be where we are if it wasn't for a lot of your mm. your input and your advice and just being there and always reminding me, John, it's about Jesus, Absolutely. right? John, it's about it's about the Father's gaze, as you were mentioning there on the yeah. couch. Praise God. Uh, <laughs> I'm flattered. I knew this was going to happen, Angel. I knew, I knew, I knew it. <laughs> Why did I come? Well, we're going to get no, into other things. Well, before before what, us start tearing you down, I wanted to build yeah, you yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> you're bringing something up, though, that I'm, I've been pondering for years and hopefully yeah. trying to live. And it is it is a spirituality of presence. It's a spirituality of encounter yeah. and of wonder. And I feel like, and I'm caught in this, too. All of us, you, me, our wives, our families, our friends, we get caught in the Martha Martha complex. Oh, yeah. And I've talked about this before. I feel like that that gospel paradigm of like Mary and Martha, the whole of human the whole human drama is in there, and we vacillate between the two. We think we gotta we gotta run, we gotta move, we gotta do, and it's like you actually don't. Yeah. But it's so hard to let go of that, and, and like we, I can just be, I can just rest. Yeah. And that's gonna fuel my creativity, and my apostle, my acts, my family life. Yeah, it's gonna flow from that still point. Yeah, and uh, I know again, like I get to travel internationally and nationally and teach this theology of the body all over, and it's been such a tremendous gift. But there's so many times when I realize, like, keep living it, just rest yeah. in it, <laughs> rest in it, and be. And there is so much fruitfulness in just wasting time, yeah, with each other. And we, just, Victor and I, being just, with each it's other. It's funny you bring that up because Victor and I just did an episode on that like two weeks ago on rest. Oh wow! Because I, I have often, like, even with the studio, I remember when people donated the money so we could build this, That's great. and then I had a place to work and I had everything that I've been looking for. Like, I, you know, I can't afford a place in East Memphis. You know, sign this lease for three years for two thousand dollars a month. I, mm-hmm. I don't know if I'll be here tomorrow, right? So, mm-hmm. so we finally get this, and I remember like feeling overwhelmed as I looked at these cameras, like going. Now I got I'm a dancing chicken. I got to go over there and perform, right? Like turn the pyrotechnics, the yeah. yeah, special like, effects. Get the Garth Brooks rope to swing out over there. You know, there's no audience in here. It'd just be awkward. With I'd like doing. to see that. That would be cool. <laughs> My feet would probably go through the wall before I got halfway across the room. <laughs> but but I remember sitting in there going like, now I got to do. I got to do right. I got to turn those cameras on and I got to start building like clips and shows <laughs> every minute. And and the Lord really took mm. me through some mm. some. 
allowed me, I should say, through some suffering in that, going like, no, you don't. Like, you just have to be here and, okay, turn on the cameras and say what you want and see how far that gets you. Yeah. Or rest in what I might want you to say and turn yeah. on the camera once a week and say it. Yeah. Like, you know, and, and it's so funny, as Victor and I were talking about this a couple of weeks ago, it just kind of hit me that, like, the only commandment we ever feel guilty about is the one about rest. I don't feel guilty for not killing anybody. <laughs> yeah. I don't feel guilty for not for not lying oh, or for well. not honoring my parents, right? But I feel guilty about not resting, like mm-hmm. about not following. Like, I feel guilty when it's I hard. rest. It's hard. Yeah. 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 I mean, anybody listening can can go back and think of a moment when maybe you're you're at work, you're at your computer, at your in your cubicle or something, and and a higher up walks by, and you're instantly like, <laughs> "Morning, boss." You know, and yeah. you're like, "Why did my tripwire go off?" <laughs> I can't just do this. Yeah. We're so because that's such this this Pope Benedict calls it the Western activist principle that we're all like addicted to. Mm-hmm. I got I gotta look like I'm doing something because that's that's because my identity is defined by that. Yeah. But just to sit back and relax. Like Greek culture, the ancient Greeks, the pinnacle was to actually come to the point of rest. Mm. Thomas Merton says that man's highest activity is in fact his rest. Sure. Like our highest activity is to contemplate, but we don't buy it. We don't believe it. Yeah, we don't. It's too and, hard. It's too hard. Well, and we. But that's where all the fruitfulness comes from. John. Sure. Like, and it is flowing. All of our fruitfulness flows from our rest, because yeah. that's where the Lord can put the seeds in. Um, I'm building out this um, new course on C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. We were yeah. talking about, right? Oh, so, yeah. So a five day uh, retreat immersed in J.R.R. Tolkien's stories and life and C.S. Lewis's stories and his life mm-hmm. next November, coming up this coming November. And there's moments in their lives, I'm reading every book I can on them, and there's so many books about these guys. And there's these moments in each of their lives where it was in their rest when the Lord just dropped an inspiration, a word, an image that created their entire Chronicles of Narnia, the Lord of the Rings. It came from a moment when these Oxford professors and dons, right, they were yeah. like super scholar. When they just sat back for a moment, Tolkien was grading a paper. He came across a, a blank page in his student's paper, and he's like, oh, little, you know, he just like started to stuff a blank page in. Sure. But in that blank page, Tolkien just sat for a moment, and he wrote, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. Mm. He didn't even know what that meant. He just spit it out, and it became the hobbit. Oh, yeah. Which morphed into the Lord of the Rings. So it was a moment of rest. C.S. Lewis... It's a great story. But C.S. Lewis was uh, he was an atheist, right? A brilliant mind, a scholar, but an atheist. Had rejected his Christianity that he grew up with in Belfast, Ireland. He's on a bus. He's got all these friends now who are Christian or Catholic. He just met Tolkien. He's on this bus in England, and he's got all the stuff in his head, but he's still in his heart. He's just like, mm-hmm. but he's on the top of this bus, one of these double-decker buses, and he's sure, going right. through English countryside. And he said, he, he describes it in his autobiography. He says, there was a moment where I felt like some armor on me was falling off. Or I was invited to take off some sort of constricting clothing. And he said, I didn't feel pressured, but I did it. <laughs> and I believed in God from that moment on. Wow. And it was two weeks later, he's in a, a, the sidecar of a motorcycle with his older brother, Warney. C.S. Lewis in a sidecar of a motorcycle, <laughs> flying through. They're heading to a zoo somewhere outside of London. And he's, he believes in God now. He's not a Christian yet. And he said, somehow on that country drive in the sidecar with my brother driving the motorcycle, I was a theist at the beginning of the motorcycle drive. We got to the zoo and I was a Christian. Wow. It was the, it was the space where the Lord, he, he let, let down the armor, let down the, the defenses. And the idea came in in his restfulness. Maybe the stories are true. Yeah. Jesus is real. You know, and all the mythologies that he loved pointed to the true mythology that became the gospel. So I ju- I'm all about this, like uh, this space of quiet, this idea of tearing and wasting, and you don't have to keep doing, 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 but just rest because that's the moment when the Lord, He like gifts you. Yeah. And then you're like, well, and then fruitfulness comes, and some harvest of stuff that you never even thought you had in you comes out. And again, the, the tribute to your ministry because it's in your quiet prayer. Yeah. And I know Angela's as well. That now we have this fruitfulness. Sure, yeah, and, and yeah. it's—I don't think anybody's ever going to be on their deathbed if we if we're graced with a deathbed moment. Going, I wish I had turned in more reports, or I wish I <laughs> yeah. had run more errands. Yeah, I should 19... have finished those spreadsheets. Yeah, oh, in 1987, man. I wish I had run more errands that day. Like we don't, nobody's <laughs> going to be doing that. At the end of the day, they're going like, I wish I had a better relationship with God. 
I wish I'd spent more time with my kids. I wish I had just played. And, you know, I've told this story a couple of times, but back when I worked for uh, Napa and I won salesman of the year, I'd yeah. been on this trip mm-hmm. and, you know, they send you this place in like Miami and it's, you know, bells and whistles and, mm-hmm. and all these guys were coming up like, Hey, you want to come to wherever and work for me? You want to come here? Cause you hit these numbers. And I get back to Memphis and I was working my territory was in North Mississippi. And oddly enough, my father who retired from there had come by for a minute and said hi, and then went back to our farm. Well, this guy that my dad had worked with forever, he was about 73 years old, still working. He was the district's operations manager for, like, the Southeastern Division. And he was sitting in there, and he had been on the trip because he won an award, too. And he said, John, you know, all I'm hearing is your name about, like, would you want to run an area? Would you want to do this? You want to?" And I said, you know, my family's here. My wife's family's here. I really don't have any desire to go anywhere else. And he said, you don't want to, you don't want to, you know, be a boss and make all this. I said, look, quite honestly, I'm a commissioned salesman. I can make as much as I can sell. So that's not an issue. But the other piece is like, I don't want 180 people's problems that I have to fix and worry. And, right. and when I said that, I said, I'm content with what I'm doing and where I am. And he, I just remember he was like kind of doing something on the computer. And when I said that he looked down and I said, are you okay, Al? And he looked back up and he goes, you know, I'm 70, whatever he was at the time. And he said, I'm flying all over the country. And I can't tell you how many times I'm sitting there closing my eyes on the plane, trying to have memories of my daughters and I don't have any. Gosh. And it wrecked me. I was just like, I don't don't want, and no offense to him and the choices he made, but like, I don't want that life. You know, I want that life. Oh, you know those, you know the movies we, we, we always watch movies and we see yeah. like, we're so inspired by them, right? We're so sure. inspired by them. And, and you see these moments in people's lives, like these convergent moments or aha awakening moments. And we're crying, we don't watch the movie, we're crying sure. and we go home and we blow it. Like we yeah. <laughs> you don't imitate what you just saw. Yeah. And I, when you said the end of your life, right? I, I feel like at the end of my life, please God, right? What's going to come to me? Probably, I hope. The, the first touch of my, my, my kids' hands, their little feet. Yeah. You know, memories of kisses and hugs, wrestling on the carpet, yeah. um, wind blowing in trees, you know, sunlight coming through. I, those moments where I just, it wasn't about me, I got outside myself. Yeah. Right, because literally this life, Peter Kreef talks about it, right? It's that the whole, the whole world is a womb and we're born into a new life. Yeah. It's just, uh, yeah, those simple encounters all the other stuff is stuff and it's it's just embodiment encounter taste of water feel of wind laughter just like and it sounds like a hallmark card right yeah. it's so, so trite but seriously when you're dying <laughs> that that's what you're going to be thinking about like yeah. the smell of the sea yeah bird song and and you're just going to be like oh my gosh that was amazing yeah. You know, I'm thinking like a Terrence Malick movie, like Tree of Life or something, where you see these flashed moments and things and and you realize like that all of eternity is contained in that right there. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. What what am I then then there's a spirit of relaxation that comes, right? Like you you suddenly realize um wh- what am I actually working for or what am I working towards? Like this is enough. And I feel like that's one of those um gospel stories where the the apostles encountered Jesus on Mount Tabor. Yeah. And then there's the amazing line where after all the glory, it says, and then, and then Moses and Elijah disappeared and it was Jesus alone. Yeah. Like that's enough for me. That's right. right. It <laughs> and is I, like, that's, that's it. What else? Do, what else am I looking for? Yeah. You talk about, I know you love music. I love, I know you love movies. Oh, I mean, yeah. we, we nerd. I mean, that's one of the reasons we got to be such good friends. We're yeah. both like super nerds for star Wars and mm-hmm. you know, you're, you're way bigger than Lord of the Rings. I'm just now getting to nerd out about that. Um, but I was more of a lion witch in the wardrobe and C.S. Yeah, Lewis yeah. guy uh-huh. growing up. I never read uh, the Lord of the Rings or anything until my children got into it because yeah. I was trying to give them something to, besides Harry Potter, right? Like yes. read this yes. instead or watch this instead. But you know, there's a song as you were talking about all this and not missing out on the things that matter. You know, Darius Rucker that used to be in Hootie and the Blowfish. Oh yeah, you know he's a country singer now yeah. and. He's got a song. I don't remember what the name of it is, but the second line starts off, and he, he's talking about we're sitting on the front porch with his wife, and he said, watching the kids uh, making noise and dragging out toys. He said, but you're missing out on the uh. sweet sound if all you hear is noise, Ooh. right? And he's just talking about like, and it mm. hit me because I was like, how many times have I told my kids, like, quiet down, be quiet, don't put fingerprints on the wall, don't, you know. Oh, the control. Yeah, yeah I, I, yeah, like, I got to. Just, just be and be kids because they're only going to do it once. 
Yeah. Right? No, it, no. I need to get that song. To yeah. Sure I <laughs> I'll that. send it to you. No, I, I, I'm with you there. Like, this is another thing. The Martha Mary, there's also, like, the the control and the letting it roll. Yeah. And now, obviously, we don't want complete chaos, right? Sure. But, but yeah, I can get overbearing and controlling, and I'm like, why? You know, I can yeah. wash this shirt. It's great. Thanks for making me this glittery thing. <laughs> My kids know I have a thing about glitter, though. Yeah, like, I glitter hate it, too. Like, ah, get behind me, glitter. Yeah, me too. But, um, but yeah, just like sometimes, saying, sometimes let it go. I'll be sending you a glitter bomb on your next oh, birthday shoot. in a box, Dang. UPS box, and I'm going to have Rebecca record the whole thing. <laughs> Great. No, I don't want our friendship to end, so I'll stay away from the glitter. But back to your thing about yeah. the movies, though, like um, I, I would like to step into that for a little bit because mm-hmm. uh, like when you talk, I've been to, to yeah, talk about like, like, like talking about your f- faith life and your encounter with God and and uh, I've which is so rich and so important in the climax of, of everything, like, sure. right? obviously. But I, I do feel like we live in a, in such a bifurcated world where we think like when I encounter Jesus or God and then all the other stuff is just like, oh, what a waste of time. Or I was so distracted. I'm sorry, Lord, that all those other things yeah, took guilty. me away from you. Yeah. yeah. And now it's just you, Lord. It's like wait, my experience with the Lord, he was whispering to me through yeah. The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, the stack of books I found in my grandma's cedar closet when I was like a teenager, a young teen. And my experience of the Steven Spielberg movies, Close Encounters oh, yeah. of the Third Kind, and Indiana Jones, George Lucas, Star Wars. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, that was even after. All. Yeah. But all, like, all those things were whispers and sort of like lullabies that God was using that put me on this great adventure. Yeah. You know, that showed me that the world is so much bigger than I could imagine. And uh and it's fun. And yeah. it's and it's also wild and it's chaos and it's but it's also uh a chance to become heroic. Yeah. Like I, I was seeing the life of virtue through these epic stories and epic movies. Yeah. And the music of John Williams that was in all those movies that I saw growing up, all the Spielberg and Lucas movies sure. was all John Williams. Superman, his, all that stuff. Oh, yeah. Man. All his his music was always haunting me, pulling me. And, you know, I remember the old Sony Walkman, you know, and the big oh, cassette yeah. tape and walking through the, the blueberry fields of where I grew up in South Jersey. And just uh, I was taking flight. And yeah. I know God was in all of that stuff. So, like, talking about my spiritual life today and my relationship with God, it was just it was a synonym for him. Like he he has many names and he comes to us through so many things. Yeah. And I feel like God takes delight in that. He he delights in the fact that you, you really loved that movie, didn't you? Or or you've been listening to this piece of music from the soundtrack of E. T. for thirty five years, Bill. <laughs> right. It's like I love that you love that. You know? <laughs> yeah. I love that you love that. There's a haunting piece by John Williams called Leaving Home that was in the original Superman, the Christopher mm-hmm. Reeve Superman. Sure. And the theme of that piece when it's when Superman Clark Kent realizes who he is and he has to travel. He leaves his mother. His father's died. He's standing in a cornfield with his mother. This is like the 1981 oh, yeah. Superman or whatever. About. Yeah. But the, the music kicks in and Clark Kent, he's a young man and he hugs his mother and then he just heads north. He doesn't even know where he's going. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I remember being like a, a young teen and then just like my heart is getting ripped out of my chest by this cinematic experience. And that's me. Yeah. That's me. I, I have to. I have to let go. I have to leave father and mother yeah. and go off to some adventure and mission. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen. But so God whispers to us through all these stories, through all these experiences, through all that. Don't chuck it. Like yeah. if you're listening and thinking, yeah, well, once you meet Jesus, you got to let go of all that. No, Jesus doesn't let go of it. Jesus brings it back. Yeah. And in the memory of what moved you as a child or a teen or a young adult, then it's like, oh, it was you all along. Yeah, that's you're so right. I mean, I remember you know reading Marvel comics and being. I always loved Spider Man mm. because I saw myself in that. I was sort mm-hmm. of the dorky kid, you know. I, I got you know pushed around and made fun of when I was a kid, and it was like, here's this kid that like mm. is gifted this this power, and then like the the whole uh, with great power comes great responsibility. Oh, killer, still mm. being a good person despite you know, the poverty and the, in the, in the troubles that he had and yeah. not having his parents and losing his uncle and all those things. Like all that spoke to me too. And mm. it I was mean, messy, so we, right? Yeah. Peter Parker's life was so messy. He was real. It oh, wasn't yeah. just like somebody that was rich and made a suit of armor or right. something. Not it a was, Bruce, Bruce Wayne, but Bruce Wayne had his own pain yeah, too. Which, that's kind of cool. Yeah. He has a whole other, <laughs> yeah. He had a lot but they're, of, uh, they're messy yeah, and very human yeah. and broken 
and like you know unresolved junk but that's where we plug in right yeah and that's where god wants us to come and meet him like you're right i remember and you and i've shared this off the air before i told you about that time i took jacob to the video store oh, video yeah. game store oh, yeah yeah and it really set me off on a lot of things because hmm. you know we look at like these marvel movies and you know i took him to that store we were picking out a video game and everybody i saw in there was like as old as me with pokemon shirts on and their whole life had become that and here was my probably nine-year-old son at the time going, yeah. Daddy, why are all these men in here? And where are their kids? And and then he started mm -hmm. on like, Daddy, why doesn't he have one of these? And he's tapping my wedding ring. Wow, and, wow. And all this stuff. And, and I'm like, hey, man, just, you know, I don't want to get beat up by like 30 guys with Pokemon shirts on there. <laughs> Let's get out of here I first. think you could take him, Jack. Anyway, I don't know. So they looked they looked like they knew moves from video games. I was just going <laughs> to stay away. But anyway, we get in the car. And I, he just unleashes all these questions, right? Why, why, why? Wow. And I start going, what am I going to say? And we've been reading in the in this children's Bible about you know idols and, and the golden calf and all those things. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, we always have a God in our life, whether it's God or not. And what these men are looking for is, you know, the games they were getting besides Pokemon was like the new uh, Jedi game. So right. I want to save the girl. I want to be the the warrior. I want to I want to save the day. I, I want to feel virtuous and. It drew me towards the Marvel movies, and Endgame yeah. had come out right before that. Yeah, and I remember sitting in the movie theater, which it was packed, IMAX. I mean, just yeah. he's got his like four thousand dollar popcorn we bought, and his you know twenty dollar <laughs> drink, and all that. And I remember the scene at the end, and by now everybody's seen it, so hopefully we're not ruining yeah. anything. But at the end, where Thanos is kind of sitting there waiting on the original three, and and you know Thor, Fat Thor, kind of gets knocked out in a second because he's out of shape, obviously. And then Iron Man gets knocked aside, and then it's just him and Captain America, and you get oh. the scene with all the, the hammer and all that. Crazy. So long story short, you know, he goes in there and he starts really giving Thanos the business for a minute, and then Thanos kind of flicks him away, and he winds up rolling end over end, breaks his shield, and and they're in that moment where it's just you could hear a pin drop. In oh there. my gosh! Yeah. I mean, a pin drop, and, and 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 people have been laughing all this stuff, and then here comes Captain America, and he gets up, and he's you know he's hobbling back over the only guy that didn't have superpowers or some suit. That protected him, right? Mm -hmm. And he's just giving it all. I mean, he did have superpowers, but he wasn't a god of thunder or something. Right. And he picks up the shield that's now broken, this Shards thing that's like, it, yeah. yeah, that is, is is just stood for like truth and American way and justice and goodness and his virtue. And it's it's put in half and he takes it and he cinches it on his arm and he looks at him like he's going to say, I can do this all day. And even Thanos looks like, <laughs> really? I know. And the theater erupted. Oh, yeah. Right? Because you knew. As, as a person that had followed Marvel, all right, these two guys aren't going to be in any more movies after this. Mm. One or both of them is going to die. So at this moment, you're thinking Captain America is about to bite it, right? And, right. And in that moment, he stands up and that theater erupted. And I remember it scared Jacob like his popcorn went tumbling. And I was like, that was $4,000, you know. But, but it goes everywhere and people are screaming. He's like, he just has this frightened look on his face. And it was because people saw virtue, like Damn. laying down your life for your friends. And I just remember thinking, man, we this yeah. is where our men are. We're lined up seeking this. Yep. But in our church every Sunday, the the or not every Sunday, but at some point on most Sundays, mm. the priest is pronouncing virtue. And, and Jesus Christ is saying, greater love has no man than this than to lay down your life for one's friends. And this is the exact same thing that we're original seeing Original Marvel. He's the original Marvel movie. Right. He's the original. He is. And, and yet we're lining up longing for something that's that's right in front of us every day. Yeah. And we want to baptize that desire and that longing. Yeah. And not, not condemn the 39-year-old the sure. dude who's buying a video game. Yeah. <clears throat> but say, like, did you know? <laughs> right. Scratch the surface, yeah. right? You know, oh, why it's, you want oh it's him. That's yeah. the that's the amazing part. There, I probably quoted this on one of the times we talked before, but this cardinal um, at the Vatican, Cardinal Papard, was in charge of like uh, social communications and, and plugged into culture, and he said cinema is an irreplaceable form of evangelization. Yeah, movies are an irreplaceable form because it's a new parable. Yeah, these are the new parables. Look at the it chosen. Is Jesus? Yeah. yeah, this is Jesus. Yeah. It really is because he's in every man in every story. And that's why it's so potent. I mean, imagine, I mean, C.S. Lewis talked about it as a smuggling of theology. C.S. Lewis would say, <laughs> smuggling we're, we're smuggling theology, right? right. And, and people getting letters, you know, C.S. Lewis getting letters from people that say, like, I, I think I love Aslan more than Jesus. Yeah. And Lewis is like, he is Jesus. That's right. That's right. right? And then when you realize, yeah. oh, and then yeah. the scales fall off and you realize everything is now infected in a good way by the gospel. Yeah. And flowing from it. Uh 
then 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 the paradigm shift happens yeah right and you're like all the stuff i've loved about these epic heroes um is is capitalized consummated in christ you know and and the cool thing is about the marvel ones that so many of have like a broken story right like tony stark and you know thor's fall from grace and everything else you realize like i can insert myself in there yeah and this is what happens like we love supernatural powers because we're destined to have supernatural powers amen yeah like why why do we dream about flight you know and, and you know impervious to suffering and strength and the ability to see through things because we will (laughs) <laughs> that's the glorified body yeah. Jesus walked through walls Jesus flew yeah Jesus was transformed Jesus could read hearts you know and there's a promise that you know we will be divinized into him that yeah. sounds crazy and scandalous but it's true it's in the Bible sure that we will be one with him right and uh then that's when we put on the supernatural yeah, yeah as St. Paul would say well yeah that's statue, right you right like we put on the new man right we, as tall as him yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's a Scottish broadsword there that's what it is like <laughs> now we're gonna talk Braveheart we're gonna talk uh, oh, yeah, Highlander let's transition into. <laughs> Highlander was but, but no one. what you're saying there like about the superpowers <laughs> it's interesting because I was a week or two ago I was with Dr. Bob Schutz yeah. we're on a plane and we were talking about this because he was talking about a men's conference thing that he was you know looking at doing and all this stuff and uh and he said John you know the thing about why people are attracted to what you're doing and your vulnerability and stuff like that is he goes, because think about it. When God put us in the garden, we were powerful. Like we had everything. Mm. And he said, and then the fall comes and we lose that power. We're, we're removed yeah. from it. He said, and you know, you will work by the sweat of your brow and it's mm-hmm. never enough. It's a, you're inadequate your whole life. Mm-hmm. And, and he said, but we're searching for the power. And he goes, if you look at it and he said, I know it's not as popular as it was when I was a kid, but you look at the magazine aisles in a store and he said, and you look at every magazine, and it's muscles upon muscles with the magazines. It's fast cars. It's GQ stuff. It's sports stars. It's it's men longing and, and, and putting on the front of things powerful individuals in one way or another. Mm. And he said, and it's just, it, it, it writes the story of how we're longing to regain that power. Yeah. And that's what you were just saying. And like yeah. the fact that we don't, we know something's missing, that we're not whole, yeah. right? And we're yeah. looking for that all of our lives. Mm. and. And the good news is, as you said, we find it, you know, if we've lived the life that Christ calls us to, and we get to spend uh, eternity with him. But it's our soul is always in search of that, and that's why these things reach out, you yeah. know, to us in the way that yeah. they do. It's one of the, you're talking about the Genesis account, right, in the yeah. fall. It's one of the saddest lines in the entire Bible, right? Um, where are you, God mm-hmm. says, which is so, such not a question about geography like where where are you and what lo, what are your digits what, what is your location yeah. adam what is your location but in but where is your relation to me yeah and then the saddest line um i hid myself because i was naked yeah and the line the next line is so mysterious from god who told you you were naked yeah and it's almost like i want to look into that the the hebrew hebraic meaning of naked there because it's like Adam says naked as if it's shameful. Mm-hmm. And God's like, I made you naked without shame. Sure. Your body, your masculinity and femininity is your superpower. You are made in my image. Yeah. You know, it's like, why are you afraid? Sure. Nakedness shouldn't equate to fearfulness and hiding. But so here's where Christ, the true hero, comes in, stripped naked and crucified on the cross. Yeah. To, to reclaim what we thought was shameful and now this is the radiant beauty and truth of what the body is meant to be heroic yeah. naked without shame like and i love the yeah. crucifix here now we cloak the lord for our own historical our own sensibilities yeah. right yeah. but the romans would have stripped him so it's like he's reclaiming the truth and beauty of the body as a radiant superpower yeah which is why the devil's constantly trying to hit us and, and hit us in the body yeah because it's so powerful well, and that's, you know, that that's, it's, it's funny you say that because when guys say, well, vulnerability, you know, that's, that's weakness. That's not strength. And I'm like, no, the most vulnerable <laughs> yeah. guy in the world was laying naked on a cross, yeah. giving everything like arms as wide as you could possibly get them, right. giving everything. I always think about that posture of his body yeah because in, you know, in God's providence, he chose this exact moment when this form of capital punishment was this. Yeah. So that his very body, like he, he knew it all his very body would proclaim for millennia the full truth, yeah. right? Like that, that's what it looks like. It wasn't lethal injection or hanging at this point. Yeah. It was so that my body is saying what you just said, total wide open total love gift. and total gift of self. Yeah. yeah. 
which is right up your alley, right? That's the T-O-B. Oh my gosh, that's the Alge the Body. And, yeah. and I have a whole photo stream. I, I don't know if I shared this before with you, but I have a whole photo stream where I grab screenshots from films where the heroes are in that exact position of Christ on the cross. Oh, wow. I've got like Mr. Incredible, Braveheart. Um, uh, there's one, for Neo from The Matrix, where he's like that, oh, right? Sure. And it's, oh, Spider-Man holding the, the two the halves two of the yeah, building the together. Yeah. Uh, Thor forming the weapon to kill Thanos, and he has to open the iris, and he's like this. And the star's full strength is beating Shooting through Thor's injured. body. Wow. Every time it's like, it's always a man in the form of a cross. In all of these epic stories, they always take on the position of Christ on the cross. Coincidence? And we don't see it. Like, yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, no. And, that's the, and, and are the writers and directors thinking, let's make it look like Jesus on the cross? They're not even thinking of it. It's in our fabric. It's yeah. in the fabric of a man's body in particular, in the sense of defending the bride, to do this. I'm thinking about all that right now. Like Every even the movie. Super movie, Superman movies. When Superman he's the same. Because he goes to space and he's just There's like, a moment in one of the yeah. Superman movies where Lex Luthor has a like a spear of kryptonite, stabs Superman in the chest. Uh-huh. He falls back like this. Yeah. I mean, if you don't see Jesus there, you might be dead, right? Yeah. Check your pulse. That's It's crazy. so Christological. And we, yet we don't see... We don't catch that, but we know there's something about We're it that calls to it us. nonetheless. Yeah. Yeah. Because theology has been smuggled in. Like yeah, the word, the logos that. that made all things, he, he makes all things and he comes in. Whether the directors know it or not. That's right. Well, hopefully they continue to smuggle it in because it seems like sometimes today they're trying to smuggle more of it out. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Know? They're smuggling other stuff in. Yeah. And that's definitely what, I mean, you know. But what's beautiful about that too. point where, and we can talk about the different franchises that seem yeah, to be I'd selling to. out now because... And the box offices are showing they're tanking. These these films that are trying to smuggle other agendas that are not Christocentric, either yeah. they know it or not, um, are failing. Because yeah. people know. And that's the voice of the, the Vox Populi, right? Or the census fidei, the sense of the faithful. This doesn't have the fragrance of the gospel in it. Yeah. Even if that person doesn't know what the gospel is, they're like, something's weird about this. Yeah, You're trying to sell me a car. <laughs> like you're, you're pushing some agenda and like, yeah. nah. Yeah, and you see it everywhere. I mean, you see it in the Disney movies. I remember, what, the last Star Wars movie? And, I mean, we're both Star Wars yeah, nuts. Yeah, yeah. And that last one comes out, and I'm like, okay, this isn't that bad. It's not the original three, but it's okay. The, the very last one, the Rise of Skywalker or whatever it was, or maybe maybe it wasn't that one. It was the one where Luke died, the second to last yeah. one in the new ones. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, well, this is cool. I'm glad, you know, I'm sitting here with Jacob and the girls. They seem to enjoy it. And then all of a sudden they show an X-Wing in the jungle and there's Chewbacca in the background and then these two chicks that weren't even in the movie come up and kiss oh, right yes. on the screen. Yes, yes, And I was like, why? Why? What? What where? is this about? And why? I mean, it, it's crammed in the last three minutes. Right. And I shouldn't have said chicks. I probably should have said women. That was probably you insensitive. Have, yeah. But <laughs> Canceled. You're canceled. <laughs> That's right. I'm canceled. My Angel just canceled Angel's me, I think. Canceled. <laughs> but uh, these two girls come up, these two women come up and do that. And I'm just like, and I can see my kids like from going to just like, well, this is one of the reasons why the Eternals also tanked and was the the, the least popular of all Marvel movies, I yeah. think, because they just forced a scene like that. And it's like when, when you do that, the, the, you're forcing it. Sure. And it's not to be forced. Yeah. It's, it's speak the truth, and our bodies speak a truth. Sure. Right. And when we deviate from that, the truth of what our bodies are saying, right, in the masculine and the feminine, it's just it's not going to work. It's not going to be fruitful. Sure. It's not going to have sticking power. You can say like, oh, well, we represent it again. Okay, but not really. Yeah, because you, you I, confiscate it again or, uh, you know, it's confusing. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, and I look at it and I'm like, I don't, why, like, I don't care, especially in superhero stuff. I don't care what they're what they're doing sexually, right? I'm seeing, like, they're supposed to be saving the world. Like, right, right. I'm not, I'm not agreeing with if someone's in a same-sex attracted thing on a screen. I'm not saying that. But, like, I don't need to know all that. Like, no. why are you even throwing that in here? Like, right. those ones we grew up with. Yeah, there were some Superman movies where they show him, you know, getting out of bed with Lois or something in the one. But, like, you're not – it wasn't ever front and center for, like, this is 20 minutes of this right. movie of of what my choices and my preferences are. Mm -hmm. and, and you're exactly right in that because people see it. And even my kids now when we're in there, like, I, Angel and I got to be in the room every time we turn on Disney Plus yeah. or whatever. Because yeah. it's like, okay, what are you watching now? And And – in fact, I, I'm embarrassed about this, but when Father Malachi, you know, was here, he was a CFR, staying with us four or five days doing an Advent mission, 
I ran out here to do something, and he was in there. And when I left, he was kind of standing back behind the couch watching. And they were watching some show like I would have been watching when I was a kid, like Full House kind of thing. Sure. But it wasn't that. It was a new version of that sort of stuff. Yeah. And he came in here, and he said, you know, you're my brother, and I love you. He said, but um, you really shouldn't be leaving your kids in there. And I said, well, what happened? And he goes, there was nothing that was blatant, but just the agenda, the underlying theme of all of this. Yeah, they're it, they're just in there glued to it, and they're yeah. they're getting indoctrinated into this way yeah. of thinking. And We're with you there. It, it's very sad. There's definitely in the last five ten years been a, a massive shift and a full blown like pushing this agenda, mm-hmm. and we've had to put more restrictions on it. It stinks, you know, but yeah. you have to do it, um, and you have to give them the, what's true, good, and beautiful. Yeah, and what has stood the test of time. So, uh, and the kids, you know, kids are going to complain, you know, oh, you won't let us. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. It's, that's what I've told <laughs> so my you, kids. You, so it is, it is a time to be strong that way. But, uh, but yeah, we have to be extra prudent. Like super, yeah, like super, the new super, Buzz Lightyear super. movie. They didn't watch that. The new, whatever the world, Strange, Strange world, world that came out, didn't Same watch idea. that. Yep. And they ask why. And I just tell them, I'm like, because it's things that, that aren't, that aren't in line with our beliefs. And here, here's the thing too. Like when, when it suddenly appears and there's no avoiding it, don't, Here's a thing, you know, advice for all of us as parents, especially, sure. right? Don't do the knee jerk reaction and run up and like grab the remote and shut it off. <laughs> throw the TV you know, off. Throw the, the ah, <laughs> grab your shoe. No, because that that will leave a deeper impression sure. for decades on your children. Yeah. Make it a moment. If it comes out and it's inescapable, it's like okay. So instead, anybody, just like so squirrel. you know what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so okay, what just happened? Everybody you can pause it. Yeah. Because we literally a week or two ago. The girls were watching a show, The Babysitter's Club. It was like a reboot of The Babysitter's Club, which we thought, yeah. okay, you know, Claire's 12, Sheila's 10. They're kind of ready for this kind of idea of, of young girls who are babysitters. And, and they throw an agenda in. Yeah. And they kind of looked at each other like, that was weird. Yeah. And we, I was in the room and we caught it and said, okay, let's talk about it. Yeah. And they, they had this visceral reaction because they've been soaked in the, the Catholic anthropology, theology, sure. body, the truth. So they recognized it. So uh, they then we said, well, we can't watch that show anymore. Sure, and that's right. We, we can't, and they know why. Like, they you know why. Like, oh darn it, it was it's good. Not a punishment. We'll at that say like point, we're like sorry because there's a lot of good stuff. Yeah, but when it starts to be subtle and change the way you look at things, you know, sure. we have our kids already asking questions about things, and that we never asked when we were kids. You oh know? yeah, and it's like okay, well. It's not all gloom and doom. Our kids can learn from this. We can, you can recognize this isn't God's original plan. And and how would you talk to somebody who if, who maybe talked to you this way? Well, we would love them, but we want to tell them the truth. Yes. Yeah. So so it becomes a teaching moment, as we say. Well, how do you? Let, let's talk about that for a second. Then we can jump back on movies that like influence you or whatever, sure. and me too. But I just know there's a lot of men that come up to me. I mean, that's what I do. I speak at men's conferences, all these things, and speak at parishes and. So many men are coming up and asking, like, what do I do with all this? Like, yeah. how do I how do I react to it? How do I because I mean it's an impossible situation to be in as a Catholic these days because mm-hmm. if you just say this isn't right, well then you're a bigot. Yeah. Or you're not you're not inclusive or you're not uh you don't love people. The gospel is all about loving people. And it's like, no, Jesus corrected people too. Yeah. Like Jesus didn't say do whatever you want and you know, you know, fly through the tulips and have a great time in life. He's like, no, there are consequences for actions and decisions, and the scriptures are, are, are open to that. And then even our faith in the catechism is just instruction after instruction about these tough issues. But, you know, how do you, as somebody, I mean, obviously you're a lot more equipped with what you do for a living than some people to deal with this. But, like, to the average guy out there that's listening right now, or woman, because there's a lot of women that listen to this too, like, what do you do when you're, when, when you're faced with that and somebody yeah. starts, you know, you're a bigot, you're a this, you're a that? Like, what do you? What do you do? Yeah, I mean, right away, as you're, as you're asking the question, John, I'm thinking of, I always want to press everything up against the Gospels, right? Always yeah. go back to Christ, because in seed form, everything's there. Sure. Everything. Yeah. <laughs> Nuclear right. war, you know, quantum physics, whatever. I'm yeah. sure I can find that, too. <laughs> it's always in seed form in the Gospels. Sure. So the weeds and the wheat is what's coming up. Yeah. Uh, we are surrounded right now by weeds and wheat. Yeah. And we're in a media-saturated world, so it's all over the place. So... What does Jesus say? You know, an enemy, the disciples come, an enemy has sown weeds into your field. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? You know, go gouge them all out, rip them out. Let them grow together, right? There there could be, and there's a translation of that word weeds that's, there's a, in some of the weeds, there's potentiality of actually becoming a good thing. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, okay, don't freak out and panic. Sure. Because that's, again, going to leave a worse impression of, um, 
of hypersensitive or too controlling. So just, okay, the weed's in the wheat. That's one thing. Yeah. And I would say that's if the thing comes at you, like if you're at the library and all of a sudden there's drag queen story hour and you've got your kids to pick up a book and you're like, okay, how do I explain this? Weeds and wheat. Okay, well, let's talk about it. The other thing though is what I think we have to be more, so that's kind of reactive. Sure. Proactively, this entertainment industry that is exploding, there's 5,000 channels and 6 million shows now kids can watch. None of it's necessary. Yeah, amen. We don't need any of it. Like literally any of it. Sure. So if you've started and now you have to siphon it off and close the faucet, that's going to be hard. Yeah. But if you have and if you have young ones, don't open up that floodgate. Okay, you don't need any of it. You can entertain yourself in other ways that are more creative, plugged into the natural rhythms of nature, right? Teaching kids how to fish, get them outside, hiking, recognizing yeah. trees and birds and immersing kids more in actual embodied experiences in the world always trumps screens. Sure. And will then put them in the catechism of creation. Mm. Then they're like, yeah. oh, I see how it works. You know, seed falls to earth in the soil and brings forth new life. The masculine feminine dynamic is in all creation. And the true diversity of God's creatures is so beautiful. Yeah. So the, they get that catechism of creation, that's gonna have more sticking power, right? Yeah. But if it's always the digital babysitter and we're plugging in, then I'm sorry, like it's gonna overwhelm. It yeah. is a tsunami. Sure. It's an absolute tsunami. So we, we give the kids some time but you know, we make sure that it's something that's not going to be detrimental, and uh, you know, it, it's hard. The, to that second point, <laughs> it's insane. The yeah. amount of entertainment, like we're killing ourselves with it. There's just too much. Yeah. So just be strong in saying no. This isn't necessary. And you know, there might be some complaining, but let's do something else. And then they get that infectious bug of like, I love doing that other thing. You know, where it's a more embodied experience of whatever sports or hiking or adventure or just creativity. Our, our kids, they love to do the, the role play stuff and the, sure. you know, all that. And they're so creative. It's just like, let that flourish. Keep doing that. Yeah. Cause that's the thing. I mean, most kids, when they're given that option, they enjoy it. Like they want, they do, they want to be out there playing and running. And yeah. And that's what I'll tell my kids. I'm like, look, when I was a kid, yeah, I had a Nintendo oh, and I played for a little bit, but then most of my time was outside playing basketball. Like that's yep. where I went to deal with my problems. If I was struggling, if I was stressed out, I went out there and I shot hoops for hours Right, right. and just was in my own thoughts and, and always felt better because I was out there doing something instead of just zombieing a screen and, right. and and seeing things that even make me feel worse because I don't look like that person. I don't have what that oh. person has. I don't, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's what all these shows are trying to get you to, yeah. to buy into the glitz and the glamour the, of things. When the kids are creative, now we're talking about kids maybe who are much you know younger. Sure. But when they're creative, again, that's an embodied experience. Yeah. And what we should do as parents is like, when they say like, look, mommy, look, daddy, we got to look. Yeah. We can't. Because if we're like, oh, that's really cute, honey. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Do as I say, not trust, as I do. Yeah. Trust yeah. me, that leaves a mark. <laughs> and you just you just blew it all out of the water. Like, anywhere. So if they say, look, mommy, look, daddy, look. Yeah. And like, wow, that is so cool. That's so creative. Wow, look what you made. Yeah. It but doesn't if, matter if we're to always you, doing the side peripheral glance while we're staring at a phone, well, yeah, that's what they're going to remember. Yeah, monkey see, monkey do. I always yeah. thought that was the dumbest thing that ever. Like, you know, never to dis disrespect my dad or anything, but like, mm -hmm. I hated that. Do as I say, not as I do. Even as a kid, I'm like, that's the dumbest thing ever. Like, <laughs> you're my hero. Like, you wear a cape. I want to do everything you do. Right. You know, like I want to be just like you. And you're telling me not to be, and and telling me to make choices. I pick at my dad now because as a kid, he used to make me eat everything. He's like, you eat that, you eat that. My dad will not eat anything. Like it's, I'm like, really? You're not going to trust? Nope, I don't want to. I don't like it. And I'm like, my whole life you made me eat everything. And it's just funny how, how so many of us are yeah. raised that way. But you make a wonderful point. It's like if you – I have guys that come up to me all the time and say, you know, I paid, you know, a quarter million dollars for my kids to be in Catholic school and they didn't come out Catholic. I'm like, dude, it's not an easy oh, bake oven. Man. Right? Yeah, like it's yeah. not. you got to live it. And Supplement. It's a, it's a dance. We're all involved yeah. in it. Yeah. If the people they, they – it's like, hard, man. We, mm. We're, and you've said this so many times to me, like we're the image of God in our kids' lives. Like you really are. And I love that line from The Crow, another movie. It's a weird movie, but like where Brandon Lee says, uh, mother is the word of God on a child's heart. Whoa. You know, and it's like, because this, this woman was 
um, her daughter was a teen and she was running the streets and all that stuff. Her mother was a heroin addict. Mm. And so he shows up with a superpower and squeezes her arm right after she'd shot up and the heroin comes out of her arm. Wow. And she sort of sobers up in the moment. And he wow. looks at her and he says, mother is the word of God wow. on a child's lips. And it, it really is. Like we have to realize that if That's we want beautiful. this life for our kids and for others, then we've got to live it ourselves. Yeah. It's very theology of the body. What yeah. You're saying. That's right. In other words, like we are – all embodied and all knowledge comes to us through our senses, through our bodies. Sure. So you have to embody all the things you're saying with your words that are spiritual truths. They have to take flesh. Yeah. The word has to take flesh. Uh, that's how it sticks. If it doesn't, or if it's if it's contracepted or contradicted. Sure. It's so damaging. It is. Like you know, already, my kids have the bug of you know because everybody's phones, phones everywhere, phones everywhere, and they'll they'll see something, they'll experience something, or dad take a picture. I'm like oh, I have my so phone. I got right it. Now. Yeah, and like I don't I don't have yeah. my phone right now. That is a great point. I was in um, Jacksonville a couple weeks ago, and it was the night that LeBron James broke the scoring record. Oh yeah. I was with the Catholic talk show guys, so they were all watching oh, it. Wow. We were at the priest house, Father Pagano, and we were staying up late. I had like a three in the morning flight. It was a ridiculous. So. But the next morning, I get on the plane, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pulling up my phone, and, and there on social media was LeBron James hitting this shot where he breaks the all-time record, and everybody in the crowd had a phone they were looking at it through. Everyone. There was, I think, maybe one guy, and then people circled him and pointed out and said, this is how life used to be. Oh, my But gosh. everybody literally, instead of experiencing the moment, I want to have a picture of the moment. Like, it's just... I don't want to be in it fully. I want to be able to show people I was there. And it's like, no, just be there. Like you missed like something that, that people will always say, I was there when this happened, but you saw it through your phone. Like you were physically in the room. It, it's just <laughs> that like, kills me. Yeah, that, it just kills me. Yeah, like it, it, it's, uh, you know, I remember going to a conference one time and all of the people are in there watching the conference and you're feeling the spirit move and all this stuff. And then there's all these other people watching on TV in a building across the parking lot. You're like, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you in here? Like everything's, you can't feel the spirit in here. And, I know people have their it's, choices and their tendencies, but like, yeah. it's I'm just, just like you're missing out on it. There's amazing things that can be communicated through. Well, I mean, we're talking about movies too, you know, which yeah. are on screens. Sure. But you, you just have to figure out the balance here. That's what's important, you know, yeah. and, and what trumps what. There's a great, let me quote a movie to make my point. Uh, the Secret <laughs> Life of the Secret Life of Walter Mitty. With oh, ben they're Stiller. Say pets. I've seen that. No, no, no. Nah. <laughs> you do have little kids. The Secret Life of Walter Mitty is a remake of an older film, and it's uh, Ben Stiller and Sean yeah, Penn are in it. it. Yeah. Oh, it is a great movie about adventure and identity, finding yourself, getting beyond your fears. I love this movie. Great soundtrack, too. But um, there's a moment where Ben Stiller's character goes on this epic journey to like the Himalayas or something or Tibet, and he finally finds. Sean Penn is this wildlife photographer. Yeah. And there's the moment when he's trying to catch the snow leopard. This, you know, you never see this thing in the wild. And there's, it, it, so the climactic movie, really, the moment is they're on the top of the mountain and they see the snow leopard. And Sean Penn's got his camera all set up and it doesn't record it. Wow. And Ben Stiller's like, aren't you going to? He's like, nah. Sometimes I just let it go. I, a moment like this, I just want to be in it. I want to be in it. I'm not going to try to grab it. I'm just going to be in it. And it's like a holy moment in the movie where you're like, oh, my gosh. How many times have I actually blown it? I'm like, oh, I got a picture. And yeah. I, don't, I don't remember. I'm not going to go back. I mean, how many? We have 50,000 pictures on our phones that we'll never go back to look <laughs> sure. at. But he just sat in that moment. It was like a 10-second scene where you just watch the snow leopard and the two guys are just looking at it. Then it passes on. It's like, whoa. Don't you think that's that, it? Like, and, and it's like the, one of the greatest weapons of the devil is to get you not to be present. Yes. Right? Because oh, God the is real only absence. found in the present. Mm, he's the real presence. The devil's the real, he wants the real absence. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Like you can't go back in the past and the future. God is now and yes. in that moment. And when we feel drawn into that, what does the devil do? The alarms go off and he starts, you know, squirrel and all these things like you're talking about, <laughs> yeah. right? Like he wants you to chase your tail like a dog and go back to putting your head down and just doing the same thing instead of being present in that Can moment. Can I just underscore this Please. point? And I'm going back to C.S. Lewis because my head's in there because I'm building out this new this new course. In the Screw Tape Letters, which is C.S. Lewis's book about you know the senior devil writing letters to a junior devil about mm. how to take us out. The Screw really, Tape, yeah. Screw yeah. Tape writes to Wormwood about how to take us out and tempt us, and it's a brilliant book. 
C.S. Lewis would say when he finished writing, though, he had to go like take a shower with his brain because he, he put himself in the mind of the enemy, which was ugh. yeah. But there's a scene where there's a guy, Screw Tape's writing about a, a client he once had that he almost lost. He said he was sitting in the in the British Museum of Art or whatever, and there was a moment where he could tell the enemy, who's God, yeah. put a thought on his head. And I, I quickly got in, Screw Tape says, I quickly got in and said, you know, it's probably time you had some lunch. <laughs> Which led him outside to the street, where then I sent a number two bus by, and a newsboy with a newspaper, and thankfully, he's safe in our father's house below. Yo, and when I read that, I got chills all right. Now. Like, holy crap, have I... Those are the lacuna or open space moments where God loves to work. That's the now. Yeah. But it's like the devil's always trying to distract. Ding, sure. ding, ding. Pavlovian response. Oh, oh, I gotta. I should yeah. be doing something else right now. No, you shouldn't. I feel. Yeah, it's <laughs> you like should going be to, in it. It's it's even like with adoration. You go and you're like, oh, I'm going to take my book. I'm going to take my rosary. I'm going to take all this stuff. Yeah. And I make the mistake of taking my phone in there so I can keep time. I need to get a watch because you know yeah. what I wind up doing. I wind up looking at my phone, saying yeah. prayers oh, yeah. on my phone, doing whatever, and yep. then I, I leave. You go down that, and I realize I'm like I was in front of our Lord for an hour. I never looked at Him for more than two minutes. Oh man, you know I'm, I hear you. I hear you. Like, and it's something we all struggle with, but it's the importance of the now and the presence. And and I just that is the one thing that keeps me up at night. You know, is is even in the ministry work and being gone and stuff like that. Is Am I going to look back at my life and look at the mm. moments I missed that God put in front of me mm -hmm. with my children, with my wife, with other people, because I was simply too caught up in all this other these other distractions? Yeah, it's just it's hard. I'm with you. It's it's the balancing. Like there's moments where he he he's using all these things to come to us. He comes to us all the time through all these things. Yeah. But I think the point is when he comes to us be it through a powerful scene in a film or a piece of music that we hear or something we see outside or, or something from our children. The thing is like when it comes, be alert and awake and stay. Yeah. And so appreciate how, do you, how do you notice, how do you do that? Let's start yeah, with that oh, for a I second. feel like, well, you know, we talk about, um, I'm doing this new podcast with uh, Father Patrick Schultz. Tell a good, us the good name friend from like Cleveland. Really yeah, so we, uh, the TOB Institute YouTube channel. Okay. So every Tuesday a new episode drops called The Way of Wonder. Okay. And it's Father I Patrick the and I. Language the hit, the drops there. The oh yeah, drops. <laughs> yeah, and we call it like hashtag Wow That's way a, of wonder. What's your Wow <laughs> moment? But each week, Father Patrick and I surprise each other. We don't tell each other what we're going to reveal. It might oh, be wow. a poem, piece of music, a painting. We've been mostly doing paintings and art for all the over the centuries. So we just splash it up on the screen with each other and like whoa, and we give a second to get hit by it. Sure. But um, the thing is like we talk about a spirituality of wonder means interruptibility. You have to have the ability to allow yourself to be interrupted. Mm. Okay, so interruptibility is really important. Affectivity, allow yourself to be moved by. So let yourself be halted. Okay, don't just like, ah, I don't have time for that. Let, let yourself be interrupted and then let yourself be moved by it. Yeah. Take a deep breath. And it's like this, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Amen. <laughs> so if you if you say that like hundreds of times a day, you know, any second you can just take a deep breath and say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Even like sometimes if my, you know, my little kid's screaming or losing it or, or whatever happens, or I'm in a store ordering a sandwich and I hear a piece of music and I'm just like, I never heard that before. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Yeah. And just don't be afraid to tarry for a minute. I mean, you, come on, you got a minute. Sure. And just say, what are you saying right now? Interruptibility, affectivity, right? And this is all couched in a, in a, in a culture of silence, too. Yeah. Quiet. So, you know, with these phones, there is a great update now where you can slide and hit do not disturb. Sure. Yeah. And you won't get on. all your dings and whistles and pop-ups. You can just hit do not disturb. Maybe have a time each day. I don't know. Depends on what you're doing. But maybe you can bracket out an hour or two. Sure. And just say, nope. And no phone alerts. And just let me be a little bit more present to what's going on now. And again, it's back to the seed in the soil. Like if 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 my shields are always up, back to C.S. Lewis, so my suit of armor is always on, nothing's getting in. Yeah. But I'm feel a little bit more like this. Receptive. Yeah. 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 I mean, the moments of creativity for me, the best moments of creativity, I'm working on something, and then I just like push the chair back for a second. Sure. 
Then that's like any artist too, working on something and then you like back off for a minute, put the brush in the thing and just like, and you discover inevitably this flash comes, not created by you or manufactured by you. We're like, oh, there it is. And you know, in the jigsaw puzzle piece, thank you, Lord. And then you dive back in, right? Yeah. And that's that bounce again of Martha and Mary. Yeah. I'm not saying, we're not saying that you don't, you're not, Mar both are saints, by the way. Sure. <laughs> Saint Martha, Saint Mary. Yeah. We need both, but it's just Mary's chosen the better part, which means I should always be more willing to be interrupted, a little bit wasteful, a little more quiet so that he speaks and I listen. Yeah. Not I'm constantly speaking. Yeah. That's, that's, a good that's point where too. we always blow it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, and, and, and for guys, we've got to quit being afraid to get hit in the feels, you know, like, I mean, yes, it's really yes. what it is. is oh man, I cry. Oh, no, that's oh. making me feel funny. So I'm just going to ignore that. Or I love those moments, man. Yeah. You got to let it pierce well, your and heart. I know when you have them, because a lot of times you send me what it is. Like the other day you sent me that wilderness <laughs> song or you send me yeah, a picture oh, of something. And, and it's just like, I appreciate that because I'm like, I know my friend found something in this. And it's important enough he sent it to me, so I find something in it too. And I love those things. And personally, I try to do that. Like after mm. Mass, on daily Mass, when all the kids have gone out of the, you know, out of the church, because I go where my, you know, my parish where my kids, my kids go to school, and there's always kids in there except for one day a week. And I wait till they're gone, and then I just sit there. And I feel the need to like, no, I need to go do ministry stuff. Mm. And it's like, yeah, I need to go do God's work. And it's like, no, God wants to work on you now. Like, hello. <laughs> yeah, it's like I'm right here. Literally, like, I'm in this box up here, and I'm looking at you, and look back at me. And some of the greatest moments I've had in this reversion in my faith have just been sitting in that empty church in the quiet, mm. listening to Pew's Creek and watching the way mm. the light dances through the through the awesome. um, stained glass windows and awesome, you know, and just being there and seeing that. What's that? Oh, oh look at that! My that's wife's trying to say it's some of the nicest texts she ever received. All my texts are nice. You just don't understand them all. Correctly. Okay, <laughs> but that's that's well, yeah. that. That this word that I'm I'm hooked on these days is this lacuna. I referenced it a few minutes ago, but lacuna is a is a word that means the space between things. Uh -huh. You know, it might be the quietness in a song where you know there's a crescendo and then it's just, and then it goes back in like that. Mm -hmm. That space, the lacuna between, is where all the action is. Yeah, and if we if we don't make space for it, there's no action. Right. It's it's just frenetic activity, but that's not fruitful action. So you're talking about Lacuna Matata. Lacuna <laughs> Matata. Ooh. All right, I'm going to do a Weird Al Yankovic on that song. That's good. Well, look, I want to know something now before we, you know, as we come to the end here in a little bit. Yeah. What? So we've been talking movies. We've been talking culture. We've been talking about things, songs, all those things. <clears throat> I want you to give, and, and I'll try to think of some too for myself, but <laughs> like some of your um, like top three movie scenes that have affected you and why. Maybe book scenes and then song. Oh, man. Okay. Well, there's some that just instantly pop right up. So sure. I, I mentioned the, it was probably 1981 or so, 1982, Christopher Reeves. I was very young. Maybe it was mid-80s when I really got it. But the standing in that cornfield yeah. or wheat field and hearing the music of John Williams and, and young Clark Kent realizing, I have to go now. I have to yeah. leave all this and go. That That still haunts me. Yeah. Beautiful. There's a moment... When did E.T. come out? 1982, 83? 83 or 82. Uh, so I'm a teenager again. Yeah. Watching E.T. And, uh, you know, E.T. dies. Sure. Dies. And he's in the freezer and he's zipped up. And Elliot's just, uh, he's crying. And then he sees the glow of the heart. And he realizes, yeah. oh, he's alive. And then he run, they rush him out of that room and the geranium blossoms back into life do you remember sure. that moment where oh, the yeah. Da, 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 yeah, da. Yeah, yeah. i burst into tears i was like 13 or whatever i forget sure. what i was i was like oh what's happening the resurrection yeah i just got rocked by the resurrection which is real but i just saw it in a movie yeah i cried i saw that movie when i was a teenager i think three times i cried all three times and i was just like what is going on inside me when that geranium blossoms again and it's like he's back yeah uh, that has always stuck with me. And this is another crazy one. This is Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom. Okay. okay so this is later now. Uh, Indiana not Jones. not the heart ripping out. Uh, no, right? not that. Yeah. <laughs> Kali I'm never seeing that as a kid yeah. going, I don't want to watch this anymore. That was actually Wait. pretty bad. <laughs> but in the opening scene of Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom, yeah. they're in Shanghai or something, and there's this crazy epic you know, beginning. 
was and there's a uh, short round. The, short yeah, round, yeah, his yeah. little helper guy. Yeah. But there's another, there's a character, and I don't even remember his name. It's literally like a 12 second scene. Sure. But he's the waiter that shows up to help Indiana, like work out this, get this jewel back or something. And apparently there's a backstory with this guy who's here for 30 seconds, but he was like Indiana Jones's helper or uh, yeah. like, a, and he ends up getting shot. The young guy and he collapses in Indiana Jones' arms and he says and I'm still haunted by this line he says Indy I've been on many adventures with you but into the great unknown I go first Indy uh -huh. and he dies I'm like I'm a teenager watching this I'm like what the unknown mystery Yeah, I go first and he dies so there's moments in films like that that opened up everything for me wow uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark is another one. Oh, I could keep going here. Sure, yeah. The moment where the Ark is opened at the end, right? Uh -huh. And the Nazis are defeated, and the, like it's all swirling around, and Indiana says to Marion, close your eyes, keep your eyes shut. And uh, the cosmic battle swirling, and then it all clears, and the stars appear, and it's quiet, and they open their eyes. And you realize the divine just broke in. Sure. And here's this archaeologist who you don't know what he believes, right? But yeah. he, he, something just happened. I just I remember I can remember distinctly walking out of the parking lot after seeing that movie with my with my family, and looking up at the stars because it was late at night. Uh -huh. and I was just like, oh my gosh, and I still couldn't say like you know Jesus is Lord. I mean I was a Catholic, but I went sure. to Sunday mass. But I was just like something's real, something's different now. Yeah, no, I, I had some of those same things too. I mean, I, and some of them were older, like Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Yeah, oh that like, was that was well done. Oh, I loved great when scenes. he the whole scene with the knight at the end and the. And, you know, where he's walking across the chasm and he has to just oh, have a leap of faith. Walk by and faith, yeah, leap of faith. Those were awesome. But for me, like, I remember, <laughs> like, A New Hope in Star Wars. Mm. Like, just this longing that there was more. Like, Luke's yes. sitting there and he's constantly fighting. Like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be yeah. here. Like, I want to be a good son, but I also there's something else out there. Yep. And that scene where he's standing there in that purple sky and the two moons and he's looking up and knowing, oh. like, my future's out there. Yeah. And then when Obi Wan and him find the um the uh the what do you call them? The Jawas machine and it's all shot oh, yeah. up the stormtroopers and he says, yeah. I want to follow you to Alderaan and I want to become a Jedi like my father oh. before me. And in that moment I was just like, This guy knows there's a destiny, there's something more for yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. Uh the scene in Return of the Jedi where you know, the Emperor is just sitting there electrocuting him. And then Darth Vader, mm. who, who it's always funny. People talk about Luke being the hero of the story. But honestly, it was it was it was Anakin's story. Yeah, the true. whole time. That's true. But like when he when he steps in and he chooses his son over over the Emperor, and like it just reminded me as a kid, I was like, man, I remember being a, a young Baptist and going and knowing that my struggles mm. in my life and how many situations I could get myself into mm -hmm. where I just felt dirty or shamed or, or hurt or not enough. And then all of a sudden huh. someone more powerful intervened and, and, and stepped in and saved me in my life. And I was like, that's not only he's playing the father figure of Luke, but that's Jesus, right? Mm. Like Jesus is stepping in and ridding me of, you mm. know, he's taking the electricity that should have been mine. Yeah, he's yeah. giving his life. And I remember just that, that moment of humanity when Luke takes off his helmet and you see the scars and you see all that. And he's like, I, you know, tell them you were right, right? Tell them you were right. There was good in me. And yeah. I remember thinking like, oh. man, like whoever wrote this must have known yeah. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, honestly, like to that moment, if I yeah. could jump in, sorry. Please, like, no. When, you know, this menacing symbol of evil for six years or whatever it was yeah. as we went through the trilogy is a wrinkled, scarred old man. Like, yeah. It just, yeah, it's a moment that suddenly there's a huge paradigm shift, and you're like, what is power? Yeah. I we just saw what actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like, this is it. Let me look on you with my own eyes. Yeah. And you just, wow. Yeah. Amazing. That, moment. That's, no, that's another one. Uh, you know, a movie is going to sound cheesy, but I think this would be everybody's answer. When I, I saw like The cheese. Lion King. Oh, yeah. The Lion Dude, King. It, when he's looking in that water. Oh, yeah. And he sees his father's face. Remember. Yeah, and he says, remember who you are, and he starts, you know, that, that whole speech and the wind's blowing and the grass. and It's crazy. And then he runs and saves the day. It's just like, man, this is such – I just remember seeing that, and I was maybe, I don't know, 14, 15 or whatever, <laughs> and just this calling in my heart, you know. Even even the dance between, you know, Nala and him, mm -hmm. as he's starting to realize, like, I'm not supposed to be out here just wasting my life. You know, chasing all this pleasurable stuff and this mm. hakuna matata and no cares and no worries. And then all of a sudden 
He's just like, no, there's a purpose for my life. Yeah. Right. And things are disordered because I'm not living in that purpose. Mm hmm. It's incredible. I, just, I remember going like, I don't know, this is like the most powerful animated thing I've ever seen in my life. Like, you know, other than the Star Wars special in like 1984. <laughs> but like, but no, in that moment, I just was like, I don't know what this is or why I want to cry and why I feel this way, but there's something more to this. Absolutely. You know. Movies are an irreplaceable form of evangelization. They're the new parables. They're packed with yeah. truth, beauty, goodness. You know, they're not always perfect. We say like sometimes you sprinkle a little holy water on them, yeah. but um, but sometimes it's staggering. Yeah, and yeah, the, when the tears well up, you just have to listen to that and say like, what 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 just happened? What Why, story? What moved me? me? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the animated films seem to do. There's a lot going on. Yeah, <laughs> I remember getting rocked by Wreck It Ralph. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Seriously, Wreck It Ralph. Please when, tell. When he there's a moment where he saves. I glitch the glitch the little. Sure. Like he's diving into a volcano, right? He's got his fist down and he's just like. Shh. Oh yeah. He's he's like it's not about me. It's all those moments of the Christ moment, right? It's, yeah. I'm laying down my life. For someone I love yeah. more than myself, right? Yeah. I love. Finally, this is the, ma the maturation of love. Like right? it's not you're good for me, but I will your good. Sure. And so that that moment when any character, animated or not, the lights go on and they realize like it's not about me. I love you more than me. Yeah. Then that just like reverberates. I feel like it sends out a shock wave to anybody who's got a pulse. Just like, whew. Yeah, I want someone to love me like that. Or I want to love like that. Yeah, everything's changed now. Yeah, yeah. I, Endgame was the same thing when we saw it opening weekend. Sure, packed theater, and grown big men next to me like Solid. practically crying. Like yeah. that. Those are literally religious moments. Yeah, they are religious moments. They take us, and that's the great gift of art and story, and literature that can take us to the very edge, right? Yeah, and then you pull back the veil. It's like that. that it's was like the, the divine peekaboo. It's like <laughs> it's me. Well, and that's that was one of the most powerful things too. I, you know, I, I really center on that Catholic, our Catholic America, Captain America, and uh, <laughs> I like that Catholic, little who knows? Freudian slip. That yeah, was pretty but, good. But, but uh, man, to see the arc of Robert Downey Jr. Oh you know, yeah, in the first oh, movie gosh, where yeah. he's like, "Hey, don't tell anybody you're Iron Man," and he's up there, he's egotistical, he's got everything, yeah. it's all about him. Yep. He's sleeping with all these women and treating them like garbage, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and he's like, you know what? He's eating a burger or something, and he sits down, and he's like, "I am Iron Man." And it was all about him and yeah. in that last scene when Doctor Strange puts that finger up and yeah. he's like, "One way." And you're going, "What does this mean? What does this mean?" You know, you're sitting in the movie, you're going, "Like, what's what's going to happen?" And then all of a sudden, you realize he's fixing to give his life, yeah. right? And he went from this egotistical, self-centered, just you know, arrogant person to just like, "I know what I'm supposed to do," and everyone else is going to live on, and everyone else is going to have their story told, and this is the end for yep. me. You know, and the beautiful piece at the end when they're when they're at the funeral and they put out the original, you know, heart replacement yep. he has. Is Tony Stark does have a heart. Proof that Tony Stark yeah, does have a heart. It's like, oh man, I know. I, I'll, I'll tell you another one, and then we can just move on to songs or in this thing or whatever we're gonna do. But like, <laughs> but uh, the Adam Project. You know, have you seen that on oh, Netflix? Yeah, we did see that. Yeah. That movie, I thought immediately of you. There's a father son scene relationship. Yeah. Because if yeah. You, First of all, the reason I thought of it is because when you came to Memphis the last time and did the date night thing mm -hmm. for the couples, which is awesome, by the way, have Bill in to do a date night if you hadn't had it before, and his lovely wife. It was du yes. duly powerful because they were both there. But um, <laughs> but there was, when you showed the next morning when we had the men's thing at my parish for just whoever wanted to come, mm. and you, we were talking, you had the Thor characters and like, oh, yeah. uh, and, and uh, Gladiator yeah. and Russell Crowe, all that stuff. Yeah. But then you eventually showed the scene from Blood Diamond with the father and that reorienting the identity. I remember watching this movie and I was like, you know, this came out and it looked like sort of a Star Wars movie for like nowadays and just an adventure movie you could watch with the kids. Mm -hmm. We did. And I was like, man, there's nothing jacked up in this. Like there's nothing like, there's no agenda I see in this. And then it comes to the end and the premise of the movie is just Ryan Reynolds is coming back to save his wife, but he also lost his father. His father died at some time in his life, and you don't know it. Yeah. And so he's trying to stop all this thing so he can find out what happened to his wife. But in the, in the movie, he's got his younger self, who is in the present time, and then his grown self. Yeah. And then the dude that plays the Hulk, Marf Ruffalo, is his yeah. dad. And the whole time, they're like sitting there, you can't tell anybody the future. You can't tell people what are going to happen. So he finally kind of come to the end of this adventure, and they walk in their house, and the little boy who had hated his mother because he blamed her mother like, he, because she wasn't his father, basically, and all this. And Ryan Reynolds had been this smart aleck jerk the whole movie. 
And then all of a sudden, he's, they're talking about the things that, that might have changed. And his dad, who had invented the time travel thing in the first place, looks at him. And he's like, hey, Dad, we got to tell you something. He's like, I know, but I don't want to know. And he's like, what do you mean? He's like, I, I know, but I, I knew there's another reason you're here. Mm. And he looks at me. He's like, look, I need you to hear something. Yeah. And Ryan Reynolds, who had just been this, like, bravado, nothing harms me, I'm tough, all this stuff, you know, shot the whole movie. And he's like, no big deal. Yeah. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, his dad looks at him and he's like, I love you. You're my son. And he's like, Dad, I don't. And he goes, no, I love you. You're my boy. I love you. And he looks at me. He's, Dad, I, I know. I know. He's, no, I don't think you do. <laughs> he grabs him by the face and he looks at him. He's, I don't think you do. Yeah. And he says, I love you. I will always come here. And he grabs him. And then the little boy version of himself, I'm getting chills. I know, right? <laughs> comes in there and they're hugging each other. And as it slowly pans down the body to show the kid, you see them hugging, and Ron Reynolds is crying, and his dad says, "Don't carry this around anymore." Yeah, you know, don't carry this, I, I, dude. I want to cry right now. It's just <laughs> like that's God. Yeah, right. With all our junk and all of our mess and everything we've ever done wrong in our life, yeah. And we sit there and we think like he doesn't love us and he doesn't look at us and he doesn't see us. And when he grabs that son by the face and he's like, "Look, I know you're hurt and all this stuff. I'm not fooled by all of this. Mm. I love you. No, you don't. I, don't. I know. I don't. No, you don't. I don't think you do." Yeah. Yeah. Right, and just just this permission, like don't carry this around anymore. Go with oh, your life. Oh, it's so good. Praise God. And I just I show that every time I give the talk Praise on God. identity and when I'm at parishes because of you, I show <laughs> that that blood diamond scene. If they have AV, I'm sorry I stole that from you, and I guess I'm asking Take it permission away. now. Take it. No and then need the for copyright. Pieces I show that Adam project because I want them to awesome. see something, you know, more more closer to the last couple of years, and it's just like the people melt. Yeah. Every time I'm up there, like, I can't talk for a second. This is the way we got it. No, thank John. This is what we have to do. I think as um, just believers, but especially from the field of evangelization and teaching, yeah. there's no other way. It, it it has to be experienced this way, yeah. that it's all about communion. It's all about the return and redemption and restoration. Mm. Amen. And, yeah, when you encounter it like that and scenes like this, movies like that, things that pierce people's hearts and they just cry – and I, don't, I can't put their finger on why yet. Like this, this is what we have to do. Yeah. We have to do it. Searching for the why. This is what Christ would do. Yeah, this is what Christ did. Sure. All those stories. I mean, he was, you know, that was their cinema. That was Those were the movies for sure. the people of ancient times when Jesus did that. You know, they're like settling into it. Yeah. This is going to be a good story. He's really good at telling stories, isn't he? Yeah, he's really good. And then by then they're like, what just yeah. happened to Except my heart? Like, he's like, wait a minute. He's talking about us. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's I don't like thing. this movie. <laughs> it, it provokes and it pokes and it stirs. Yeah. And um, yeah, just we got we to gotta allow ourselves to get moved more. Yeah. And it's, what is it? Paul VI, I think, that said, um, you know, the greatest, if, if you're a teacher, the greatest teaching you could do, I mean, I'm slaughtering it, but is to be first a great witness. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And that's what yeah. these movies are. We is need witnesses, witnesses more than teachers. Really. Yeah. yeah. I think it's post Paul the six, but mm-hmm. it is. Yeah. Yeah. Bill. I mean, I, I, like I said, I didn't know what we we're going to talk about on here. We've been going on for about an hour and 15 minutes. Have we? Oh yeah. Gosh. It's just awesome. And I could go longer, but I just, you know, I want to end with a couple of things. I know there's some songs in your life that have spoken to you. I know one that you used to write about and I, I used to love this song in the 80s when it would come on FM 100 and I have my tape deck ready to record it because we didn't have anything else. <laughs> Play and record. Yeah, you'd always get like the, the front without the end or something, but <laughs> but it was Higher Love. Oh, you know? Steve Winwood. Yeah, and now I hear that and I'm like, think about it. There must be Higher Love. And I'm With like, that, oh, it's so good. Oh. Yeah, I know it's one you've written about. Yeah. That, that you've, you, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. You. Give me some other ones real quick. Oh my gosh, there's so many. Um Anything by Van Morrison in the mid '80s is okay. mystical and poetic. Yeah. Um, uh, U2. I know they've been overplayed in some ways, but there's haunting stuff. Joshua Tree from, stuff from yeah. Joshua Tree and and beyond. Um, oh gosh, I'm a huge folk uh, singer songwriter guy. I love the folk stuff because there's yeah. there's real poetry there. I've been gobsmacked by Indigo Girls too. Really. I remember, like, yeah, I know there's, you know, no, I'm laughing at whatever there, not in but yeah, lack of manhood. So <laughs> they're the harmonies, right, yeah. and and the poetry of what they're saying there, and they're they're all about opening up the heart. Um, gosh, I'm on the spot here, but I I'm, I'm kind of moved by all matter yeah. of music. I, I have playlists on my iPhone. I may have told you this. You know how John Paul breaks open the whole drama of the human story as sure. original man, historical man. And glorified man, like where we're going. Yeah, I have playlists in my phone, original, historical, and oh, eschatological. Wow. I'm sure you do. So yeah. when I hear a song 
that like takes me back to that innocence or the beauty of the beginning. It's, I drop it in that one. If I hear one about the battle, you know, the, the historical sure. man it goes in there, and then the, the longing for the future. And there's all kinds of artists in there. I'll have to show you tonight over the campfire. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, we're gonna have a cigar and some fires. Yeah. There, there's get jealous, music. Folks. Yeah, no, but oh, and I, you know what I love most, and I can't think of a million songs right now, but I actually prefer the secular stuff. Yeah, sometimes. Because they don't you know, even realize. That I mean, praise and worship is beautiful, but yeah, when when there's like a oh, shoot, Dave Matthews, bartender. Yeah, that's a great one. When when I you know, and there's a beautiful live uh, rendition. He's with a I forget the guy's name, but he's a slide guitarist, and Dave Matthews is singing bartender to like ten thousand people, and he's in the ache. Yeah, and I mean the, the the lyrics are explicitly like he's talking about Christ and Judas and the two different vines you drink from. Which sure. one is it? I'm just like. When it when it comes from a source that's not, again, not that Christian music is trying to sell something, sure. but sometimes they no, too no. explicit. Yeah. But when well, it comes to, to elicit a response in a lot of ways, yeah. And, and if it's yeah. you know, but but sometimes when it comes from a different source where it's just an honest seeker, and you don't expect it, yeah, you don't expect it, yeah. and they draw, and and it's like, wow, mystical. Yeah. You know, I, I there's a singer songwriter Trevor Hall. He's a young guy from North Carolina. Um, and he's been influenced by Eastern thought and different stuff, but sometimes I listen to his songs and it's like, this is Teresa of Avila or John of the Cross. This dude is <laughs> mystical, but he's not using explicit Catholic theology or whatever. But I'm like, this is the dark night yeah. of the soul. This this is the mystic way. He he references the, the mother. He talks about motherhood in a way. And I'm like, what? And he's got kind of a reggae sound, sure, a little sure. bit of rap here and there, but... It's just that's that's the moments again when you're listening to any kind of songs or your music that you grew up with and you loved. Give yourself that lacuna moment and just yeah. ask, like, "Speak, Lord, your servant is listening." Why? Why do I love this song so much? Yeah. Oh, I, I experienced the same thing. There's I, something in it. I love them. I've always grew up listening to country because it's what my dad oh, listened yeah, to all the time, like the George one. Jones and all those things, and you know, balladier stuff, Waylon Jennings, all that. But there's a couple guys now, like I've been listening to a guy Zach Bryan here lately, and he writes a lot of songs about his mother and the relationship with him, and I'm mm. just like. They're, they're poetry. Like, it's yeah. just, I, I started hearing them and I was like, I don't even know the words and I just want to listen to this song again and again. Mm -hmm. uh, Sturgill Simpson, he's got one called Just Let Go. And the line that opens up is, woke up today and decided to kill my ego because it never <laughs> did me any good anyhow. Wow. And he says, uh, something like, I'm going to I'm gonna throw my, uh, my, oh, my craves out into the water. And then he starts, to, I mean, he says some things like, Wow. I saw Jesus play with flames in a lake of fire, and he just talks about all these things. And, you know, it's just amazing. And, and when I hear that music, I'm just like, these guys are longing. And he's even got an album called A Sailor's Guide to Earth. And he wrote the whole thing about his life and get kicked out of the Navy. And then the birth wow. of his son changed everything. Wow. And so you can hear him moving from like, he got kicked out of the Navy because of psychedelics and all these drugs. And, like he talks about spending six years on a life raft on the floor, right? So he's talking about that. Wow. But then he, his son's born, and he goes into these just beautiful songs, and he's like starts to mm. singing about life to his son. Mm -hmm. And the last one's called All Around You, and he talks about God in it the entire time. Wow. And it's just, I find those things, and I'm like, to your point, you, sometimes you can feel guilty because you're not listening to like, you know, Caleb, uh, you know, something, good, good something, father yeah. or something, yeah. you know, like on repeat constantly. Right, Matt Marr, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Hey, Lord, I need you or something like that. <laughs> and Matt, love Matt Marr too. But like, there's a time where we're also, we need those other entrances where we find. Smuggling theology. Yeah, where you're, yeah, I guess that's what we're going to call this, smuggling theology, because it's been a brilliant. recurring theme. Write that down, Andrew. Yeah, so. Look, we're getting here to the end. I know you're getting hungry. You have been on a plane all day. You've been great to be here. I've heard your stomach. I know the mic didn't pick it up. But oh, yeah. I'm oh, just sorry. But, okay, let's talk a few minutes about the Theology of the Body Institute. Sure. Let's talk about you've got the Way of Wonder, which I know you love to, yeah. to, to teach, and you've been talking about that. You've mentioned a new course about C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. First yeah. of all, what is the TOB Institute? <laughs> What do you do to get there? <laughs> is it virtual? Is it in person? What do you teach there? And then also, I know you're working on another book, and you've also contributed yeah. to books lately, so share all that. Deep breath. <laughs> and go. Yeah. You, so, the timer's not on the, the breath. Well, <laughs> the Alex and Body Institute has been um, – I've been with them for 17 years now, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, the last 10 years has been full-time. Absolute gift and dream job. I cannot believe I'm part of it. Yeah. So what we do, like if you, through the funnel here, is we do immersive in person, and I'll explain that in a minute. We also have online, but 
because of COVID. Yeah, sure. In-person five-day retreats centered on theology of the body. John Paul's beautiful vision. We've, we've, I've been alluding to a little bit about what does it mean to be human? Why are we here? What is this ache? Family, marriage, the whole, it's all wrapped in this beautiful sacramental vision of the human person and sexuality. And it's, it's human life, humanity sure. 101, theology of the body. So we do a host, probably close to coming on a dozen different courses with different faculty. I teach a few courses. Christopher West does. We have um, Jen, uh, yeah. Yeah, Jen, Jen Settle, yeah. yeah, Jen Settle, Dr. Janet Smith, Dr. John Haas. Uh, Father Koopman just taught Catholic sexual ethics with us. We had Dr. Peter Crave teach yeah. for us the philosophy of um, John Paul II. So you're immersed in a retreat experience with daily mass and adoration and prayer and then lecture. But it's always taught in a way that's like, visual and audio like Christopher and I love to teach this way with music and video clips and it's not just for your head it's for your heart yeah so anybody tobinstitute.org you'll find our in-person courses and because of COVID now we probably have almost all of our courses recorded you can take them online and we're rotating all the time sure right now we have like a hundred people from all over the world taking Catholic sexual ethics with Father Koopman online because wow. we recorded it and we'll chime in with live Q&A sessions during the two weeks you can watch it so we've had thousands of people come through and become students and get certified in the teaching. It's for anybody and yeah. everybody. It's not just an academic pursuit. It's really more of a, it's a course, but like a retreat. Sure. So I teach the way of beauty, theology, body, and art. I teach um, now John Paul II's writings on gender, marriage, and family, theology, of the body, one. Um, and the new course is coming out on Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, sure. which is in What's November. Poets for the Kingdom. Okay. The sacramental stories of C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien. Oh wow! I want to we we so opened bad. it up. <laughs> or we opened it up early. We have eighty four people registered for a course that's in November. Yeah. Like already, it's amazing how it's blown up because it's it's tapping into something. So, along with that, we have our YouTube channel. So we have sure. you know TOBI. Uh, go on YouTube and look up Theology Body Institute. And we have a host of different things. Christopher does some work. Um, Elizabeth Busby does some great stuff with discerning marriage and relationships. She's awesome. And then uh, I'm on there with Father Patrick. Once a week we do, on Tuesdays, we do on The Way show. of Wonder, which is akin to The Way of Beauty. It's this idea of coming at life through poetry, music, art, stuff that moves you. Yeah. And really all of it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's not just looking at beautiful paintings of you know puppies with ribbons around them or something. <laughs> it's like it, it, we plunge into all manner. And then... So we look at the art, and then we just talk about what's going on here. Sure. And how can we apply this to our life, like these different topics. We just did a painting of the Good Samaritan last week. We've done a whole host of different kind of images. And, yeah. And, yeah, so we also have a book called uh, – we have a press now, Institute, TOB okay. Institute Press. We just put out God is Beauty. Yeah, that's Christopher last wrote a year. Lot of that, right? Yeah, so it's a retreat we found from John Paul II when he was a young bishop. He oh, gave wow. a retreat to artists. So it's all about beauty and art from JP2's lips. We got it translated into English. Then Christopher wrote a chapter. I wrote a chapter. Jen Settle wrote a chapter. Mike Mangione, great yeah, musician, sure. friend of ours, he wrote a, uh, a chapter. And uh, I have an interview with an Irish sculptor in the book. We transcribed it. So that's that's another vein of this. We're really feeling called to opening up art. Yeah. Because uh, you know we're in such a like sort of technical, digital, scientific only age. We're kind of just sometimes we get lost in the numbers. And we feel called to awaken beauty and, mm. and awaken the affective part to your sure. to, right the vulnerability right of like let life move me, yeah. so so that's why we have a, this book now out called Goddess Beauty and I'm working on a book called The Way of Wonder as well yeah well, four chapters awesome. down out of nine so I'm still working on that oh it's, it'll be great when it comes out I'll be the He's first dead. one to buy one I'll tell you that much Good man. nice yeah free and, copy John. They, they, free yeah, okay well I'll send you some money in the mail whatever but <laughs> <laughs> anonymously but no I would love that. You know, Bill, you do great work. And, and I, like I said in the beginning, and I wasn't trying to get sappy, man. You're like one of my favorite people in my life. Every <laughs> time we're talking, it's just, it's a blessing. Um, I could sit here and, and honestly, what you've talked about movies and what you talk about songs and like the ache or something that stirs within you. Every time I'm with you, whether it's on a phone call, whether in person, whether watching you teach like you're going to do tomorrow for three hours or whatever hmm. at, at the parish. Like there's something in me that's like I want to know more of this, mm -hmm. and I want to become more of this, mm -hmm. right? And Thanks that's God. you know, you guys. I remember you asked me to be on the virtual TOB conference the first one you did, and and I remember saying, Bill, 
I, why would you want me? There's like eight billion other people that can read you this <laughs> stuff backwards, and I don't know anything about it. And you said because of that. You said because, John, you've experienced it. And I remember the reason I even thought that I could do that is because I asked you one time. I said, Bill, this thing is like 700 million pages long, <laughs> and this guy talks in circles, and like, you know, to John Paul is yeah. in a second. And I said, can you just tell me what theology of the body is in a couple of words? And you said, be a gift. Oh, That's what it means. Yeah. Be a gift. And I had no idea what that meant until I was around you more and more. And then I realized like, it's just another way of life. It's a way of looking at things and yeah. living yeah. the way that the scriptures call us to, but through this beautiful explanation of John Paul II and through gifted people like you that can make it real, like make it for everyday people. Mm. And so I appreciate that. I thank you for your friendship. I thank you for being here, for blessing the people you're going to bless in the diocese tomorrow. My but pleasure. I, I'm looking forward to getting a hamburger and a cigar and a bourbon with you. <laughs> Let's do it. Angela, that's a wrap. Yeah. Right. Thank you. God bless. Thanks, John.